The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Access Television, the City of Oshkosh, the Oshkosh Cable Television Advisory Commission, or Time Warner Cable. everyone. Welcome to another edition of Ayan Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hentz. On this edition, we're joined by a gentleman who first came to be known by all of us a few years back when he stood on the steps of the Winnebago County Courthouse and said there is corruption in the DA's office, and by God, I'm going to do something about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, eventually, um, Mr. Jelinski's um, words came true, and uh, Joe Paulus was uh, brought up on federal charges for bribery. Um, he was uh, convicted and is currently incarcerated. Um, he's sentenced to nearly five years in a federal prison. So EJ is uh, joining us for the next hour. He's going to be telling us what he knows, what he wants to know, and what he's doing to find out about what's going on with uh, the Joe Paulus saga. Um, also, Tony Palmieri uh, had some professional obligations this evening, could not be here. Um, I, I was all set to do the show myself, and one of the crew said, hey, I got an idea for you. So <laughs> I, uh, I took him up on his suggestion, and uh, this gentleman has graciously appeared to be here, someone who most people would think would never be um, co-hosting an interview stage with me, but I am very pleased to welcome Stu Rickman, the executive editor of the Oshkosh Northwestern here, and uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, I appreciate I, the opportunity. I appreciate your, <coughs> your being willing to do this. Uh, and um, thanks to the crew member for, for coming up with the idea. Yeah, I, I want to get his name, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll, we'll talk. <laughs> but, EJ, thanks for, uh, for being here as well. Um, I, I guess, you know, despite Paulus's incarceration uh, in, in a federal prison, um, there's been two different investigations going on, one from the, from the state standpoint, the uh, Attorney General's uh, office, and also, the Winnebago County District Attorney's Office was conducting their own. Um, that's been a few years, at least, that these things have been going on. Um, and recently, uh, we're taping this uh, in, in mid-April, but um, last month, all of a sudden, Bill Lennon, our DA, says, we're packing it in, and he shipped all of his stuff off to, uh, to Madison. What is going on? Well, <laughs> do, you, do you want what I think is going on? Or sure, okay. yeah. What I think is going on <laughs> is at the time that this occurred, uh, my opinion is um, that uh, Bill, was, Bill was running against Karen Seifert for the for Circuit Court Branch 4 in Winnebago County, and he took a pretty strong hit in the primary, and I think some of his advisors, or at least the people were listening that he was listening to, were telling him that one of his campaign promises when he came into the district attorney's office was that he was going to clean it up and he was going to get things taken care of and that there was a feeling in the community that he hadn't finished his job yet before he was moving on and i think that uh, he got some advice where people said why don't you close the investigation why don't you stop it the ag's office is doing most of the work anyway and say that you've completed your job and then that gives you uh that gives you some credibility saying i have completed the work that i intended to do when I set out to be the DA and now I should be elected a judge and I think that was some of the underlying underlying reasons for what was going on there. Well you had some pretty um, strong feelings about that you went on local radio and called him uh, what was that a nincompoop? I think that was the <laughs> word that I used that's right that's right what it was the least stern term I could come up with in a public function so. But, but I mean clearly I mean and I know that the, the Northwestern feels differently about this but it doesn't seem to me like he did his job. I mean, it looks to me like he stopped at midstream. Well, I, I have to say that I read the editorial that the Northwestern published, and I agreed with it to a certain extent. I think that the Northwestern is right in saying that the public, there's a, there's a strong public desire in the community to have this done with. There's a desire personally for me to have this done with. But I think that there's a difference between just having it done 
and having it completed with full disclosure so that we know what went on, what the investigations produced, and then putting it to bed. I would agree that four years later is ridiculously long to conduct this type of an investigation. Now, it might actually take that long, but after four years, the community really has a desire to, to put an end to this. Mm -hmm. And I think, that, I think that Bill Lennon, as tone deaf as he is politically, uh, completely misread the situation. Here's the problem. The district attorney said we completed and conducted an investigation over the course of three and a half years. We've restored integrity to the district attorney's office. Thank you very much. I did a wonderful job. Well, it continually begs the question, what precisely is it that you've done? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, we've, re we've turned everything over to the uh, attorney general's office. I think that's a little disingenuous. His office has been turning things over to the attorney general's office for three and a half years as things come up. If he wanted to, but, but if he wanted to stop his investigation and uh, have the Attorney General's office handle it, there really was no reason for him to publicly declare that his investigation was done, knowing full well that the Attorney General's office was still looking at his information. He just could have closed the investigation and not said anything and let the Attorney General's office go forward. But he felt the need to publicly state it, that it was done. And I think that the reason he felt the need to publicly state that was because he wanted to get that out in an election year. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> you filed an open records request for the, uh, the results or the, the documents that uh, Mike Balskus had accumulated and forwarded to the Department of Justice. Uh, has your request been denied or has it been, have, what have you heard from the district attorney's office? Uh, approximately five days after I filed the request, I think I got a letter from Bill saying, we uh, are conferring with the attorney general's office. We've received your request and we're conferring with the attorney general's office. That was 20 days ago, which I think is outside what the attorney general's office opinion has said is a reasonable time for response. I have not gotten a denial and I have not gotten access to the records. And I don't know whether Bill knows or not that there's a specific Supreme Court case on point that says that district attorney's office records are exempt from the open records law and that he doesn't have to turn them over. My hope and expectation was that he would deny my request based on that case, and then I could file an action for mandamus in circuit court, saying that that case shouldn't be applied in this circumstances because the public interest overrides the district attorney's office privacy in their files. Because the district attorney's office in this case is in essence investigating itself. And so there's an overriding public interest there, and so this Supreme Court case shouldn't apply. And that's the argument that I want to make and I'm unable to do it because he simply not responded in any reasonable fashion to my request at all. What is, what is it that you're uh, hoping that the, the files will disclose to you? And, and of course, uh, any private citizen could do the same thing that you've done. Um, is it a matter of curiosity on your part, or are you interested in seeing the depth and breadth of what his investigation uh, I would like to see what the depth and breadth of the investigation is. There are a lot of rumors running rampant in the community about what's known, what happened, what didn't happen. And, and again, I think that the district attorney's office, after doing its investigation, releasing that information to the public, letting the public take a look at it, is a healthy thing to happen. It, it puts a finality to everything that went on. Now, rumors will always exist and people will always have conspiracy theories. But uh, I want to see, my, my, my irk is this. When I did what I did with regard to Joe Paulus and ran what most people consider to be the messiest campaign in Wisconsin state history, um, I took a lot of hits for uh, what we were trying to do and what the information that we were trying to get out there. And I understand um, how all of that occurred, but when Bill Lennon says, I've stepped in, I've conducted a thorough investigation, I've restored integrity, and I'm done now, but by the way, I'm not going to tell you anything that I did, that really bothers me personally. And I don't think that's the proper way to conduct an investigation. I don't think it's a proper way to run the office. Do you think that um, there's any degree of collaboration going on between the county district attorney's office and the Department of Justice that may have compelled Mr. Lennon to, to refer the files to the DOJ? I jokingly say that Bill Lennon is referring to, is uh, complying with my open records request one page at a time by the <laughs> leaks that his office is giving out into the public. But I think it's pretty clear mm -hmm. from that uh, letter that the Attorney General's office sent to his office that uh, I don't think there's any collaboration going on at all. I think the Attorney General's office is fairly irritated and upset with Bill Lennon and the way the District Attorney's office has handled their end of this investigation. Uh, the DA's office had a John Doe that they started in Winnebago County, and uh, that has been basically in stasis without any activity going on uh, for the better part of almost a year now. Uh, and I think it's because the Attorney General's office said, no, no, we'll do it. You stay out of it. 
there's two ways to interpret Bill Lennon's pledge to bring integrity back to the district attorney's office. Uh, one way to interpret it is that going forward, this office is going to be squeaky clean. We will not have a repeat of Joe Paulus. The other way to interpret it is that he would launch an investigation and, and find out if there was more criminal activity going on. Um, could he not make the argument that he's fulfilled a portion of his pledge by maintaining, as far as we know, and, and no reason to believe otherwise, a, a clean uh, uh, DA's office with a high level in, of integrity? Would you give him credit for doing that? What I would like to see, and what I hope is not an impossibility, is that Winnebago County can have a district attorney's office that is effective at prosecuting cases and ethically clean. We had a district attorney's office that was fairly effective at prosecuting cases, but was corrupt to the core. Now we have a district attorney's office that I would agree is ethically sound, but doesn't seem to be very good at actually doing its job. Well, and, and we'll talk about those, uh, some of those cases a little bit later on, but you had indicated um, to the, the newspaper and, and perhaps elsewhere too, that if he does not honor your request, um, that you're going to file a lawsuit. Obviously, that's still your intent. How, how much longer will you give him, E.J., before you proceed with filing some kind of action? I don't have an answer to that specifically, other than what I'm doing is waiting a good long time so that there's <laughs> no doubt that he failed to comply with my request. Um, <coughs> and, so and perhaps if he sees this show, he'll go look up the Supreme Court case and then send me my <laughs> denial so that I can move on. So <laughs> some of the ground we're going to cover is, is conjecture uh, by its nature until until there are charges that come forward or, or no charges. Um, is there reason to believe that there is unprosecuted criminal conduct that occurred under Joe Paulus that has not been addressed? I believe there is, yes. And, and what, what would that look like? What when we originally conducted our investigation and found uh, cases and then turned those cases over to the FBI, the two individuals who were eventually prosecuted in the, in the bribery uh, allegations uh, were not the only individuals that we found that fit the pattern of conduct to a T. There were a number of other individuals out there that did that. And um, I think that my hope is that this more thorough investigation may turn up some of those activities. Here's my theory about Joe, and this is completely a theory. The, the, the FBI never really took this case that seriously. They wanted the slam dunk. They went after Shireland. They found 22 cases that they thought were very prosecutable. They went to Joe and said, Joe, we have 22 cases. Tell us about them or you're in big, big trouble. We'll cut a deal with you and you'll only plead to two charges if you, you give us what we want. But Joe knew that the AG's office was investigating too. And he knew what the feds had, but he didn't know what the AG's office would do. He hoped that they never found anything. So he gave the feds precisely what was necessary in order for him to achieve the plea agreement that he got, holding everything else back in case the AG's office came up with something so that he could give the AG's office all of the rest of the information and avoid a prison stay in Dodge. That's my theory. And Basically cutting a deal. And I think he's done that because he's, he and Mitch both said, 22 cases, that's it. The feds stood up in a press conference and said, this is it, $48,000, 22 cases, no more. But we know of at least one, maybe two more cases since then that have come up where Mitch and Joe were involved in, uh, in briberous conduct to get drunk drivings reduced. The Rutho case that came up uh, during one of the last election cycles. Mm -hmm. That was not with, uh, in the 22 cases. That was a separate case. I don't think anybody believed that Joe Paulus would, would uh, ruin his, his career and his futures for $48,000. No. I, mm -hmm. I think the, the no. presumption was there was a lot more money there that uh, he was receiving. Um, if anything, Joe always swung for the fences. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and <laughs> there, the conjecture is that there's other private attorneys that were uh, uh, involved. Um, are, are you at liberty to, to discuss the uh, private attorneys who may be under investigation by the DOJ? I'd like to, but I'd prefer not to. I'll see what the Department of Justice has Are there to names say. there that the community would be mm -hmm. surprised if if they were charged? It depends on whether or not they've represented you in the past. Well, I, um, by, <laughs> by, by, way of, by way of stature and reputation. Yes, right? I think so. I think so. There were, there were three attorneys that, uh, when I started working in the district attorney's office, there were three attorneys that Joe brought into my office and said, give them your private number, what they want, they get. One of them would have been Mr. Shireland. That's correct. Before he joined the DA's office. And there were two others that were ostensibly getting very good attention from the DA's office on yes. behalf of their clients. Yes. And those were the, and, and of the cases that we'd uncovered, those three attorneys were the ones that turned okay. up. And uh, you had the fortitude to step forward and, and dig into the, the 
Sherilyn um, connection. Uh, surely other assistant district attorneys were had the same rules of the road for the two other attorneys. Um, why did nobody raise their hand and say, if we're cutting deals for Mitch Shireland, what about the other two attorneys? I, I say the same uh, thing that I always have, that all of the assistant district attorneys who were in the office knew exactly what Tom and I knew when we started looking. We did not know when we started looking into this stuff that Joe was taking bribes. We knew that he was he had very inappropriate relationships with certain defense attorneys that were at least unethical. And we wanted to see if there was more there. Every other assistant district attorney in that office knew exactly the same thing. But they were very, very scared of Joe. And they didn't want him hurt. They had been there longer than we had. They had families. They had homes. They had careers. And they had seen what he had done to other assistant district attorneys. And they didn't want to get into it. Well, that would lead, lead to the question that at, at the very least that they are ethically culpable for what happened in the DA's office. I don't believe that any of them were involved in the bribery scheme, but I do believe at the very least that I have always said that at least I think OLR should publicly say shame on you, but I don't think they're guilty of any criminal activity. You don't really believe OLR is going to take any actions on attorneys in a district attorney's office, do no, you? No. I, I believe it'd be difficult to, for OLR to take... No, I don't think they will. I don't think they will because uh, it's, a, it's a gray area where these assistant district attorneys would say, I didn't know for sure. My obligation to report doesn't attach until I know for sure. And OLR doesn't like those kind of gray areas. And that's why these attorneys are... I mean, I don't hold it against them. I know the type of atmosphere it was to work in that office. It's when they publicly say, I had no knowledge, I didn't know, I'm completely innocent. That's what irritates me. At least be honest and say you were a coward. There is a document purportedly floating around uh, where Assistant District Attorney um, Rob Sager was asked specific questions about a specific case by the OLR. Uh, the answers would lead any reasonable person to, it would not pass the smell test on, on any level. And yet the OLR took no action or, or sat it out. Uh, how does a lawyer explain that to, to the public who, who's wondering who's watching the hen house here? I, I honestly have no idea. I have, I have asked the director of the OLR that question. And he said to me, um, we, our office is not capable of handling uh, uh, cases of that magnitude. I mean, this is a case that was best handled by the FBI conducting a criminal investigation with all of their resources and background. It was not a case that was best handled by the Office of Lawyer Regulation. But that still doesn't answer the question, well, then why did you dismiss it? Why didn't you just hang on to it and see if the FBI did something? Which they eventually did. But why send a dismissal order back? Why not just wait and see what happened? I, I don't know. At the same time, Joe filed an OLR complaint against me for spreading malicious rumors and lies mm -hmm. about him. The OLR took a year and a half to dismiss my case, and then Joe appealed it roughly 30 days before he was indicted by the federal government. And it took them another three months to have another meeting and decide that my case was going to be dismissed. Recent uh, uh, issue of Milwaukee Magazine uh, did a fairly lengthy uh, expose on, on OLR and focused on, on the Paulus case prominently, covered some of the ground that Alex Hummel covered in a story in the Northwestern. And it links back to a complaint that Judge Carver had made very early on about uh, uh, how cases were being dismissed and reduced. And, and uh, one of the cases was handled by uh, Brad Preby. Um, the lawyer representing OLR didn't believe it for a minute. And, and yet, even out of that, uh, there were no sanctions, no, no warnings, no cautionary. Um, does the OLR have any teeth? Uh, is the public being protected from unscrupulous lawyers? If you take $5,000 from a client and you don't do any work for them, the OLR will be all over you. They're good at stuff like that. If you don't return a client's phone call, they'll take care of you. They're good for things like that. But the rest of, of the more complicated uh, scheming uh, criminal activity, no, they have no teeth at all. Um, th and the problem, I think, exists with the local investigative boards. In this area, local attorneys who work with each other on a daily basis sit on a board that investigates each other. And that is precisely why I think Joe was able to avoid a lot of those pitfalls because Mitch was on the investigative board, other attorneys that worked with him were on the investigative board, attorneys who had to come uh, and, and negotiate with him knowing full well his reputation if you crossed him. And you know he, he should have been, or these complaints should be investigated by a, a board of attorneys from a different area of the state perhaps. Mm -hmm that don't have these close associations. I think that's one of the pitfalls that occurs. Have you been interviewed by investigators from the DOJ regarding uh, any criminal activity by Joe Paulus? 
Um, no. No. Does that seem strange to you that they wouldn't uh, at least ask you if there's any other additional information they ought to be looking at? There are no. There are no. In the the um, the uh, what do you call it? Um, it's not the DOJ. The uh, the investigative body of the Department of Justice. The investigators that take a look at what's going on have not contacted me and have not talked to me. And I'm assuming it's because. My understanding is that they now have the cases that the FBI had, all the information that the FBI mm -hmm. had, and we provided the FBI with all of the pertinent information that we had, and we have not subsequently had anything new. So I'm not surprised that, um, um, oh, the, oh dear, I can't remember the name of the investigative agency for the Department of Justice, but I'm not surprised that they haven't, that they haven't talked to me. Well, how, how does this work, E.J., when, n okay, now Mike Balskis from the uh, local um, DA's office had been working on this, and he prepared, I believe it was a 50-page memorandum mm -hmm. that he sent off to um, the Attorney General's office with all the supporting documents and so mm -hmm. forth. Now, that is what, going to be combined with the Department of Justice's investigation, or will they investigate them as two separate entities? I, I really have no idea how they're going to do that. At th this point, you know, given what I think is the relationship between the local district attorney's office and the Department of Justice, I think they'll probably throw it away, but I'm not, I, I don't know. I don't think that they... It doesn't appear to me that they've been provided any information by the district attorney's office that they already ha don't have themselves. So this was basically just a way, as you said earlier, for Bill Lennon to just say, I've restored integrity, I've cleaned things up, it's a smooth sailing ship now, and move on. It, it could be, I, and I don't know the details, right. because I don't know what he conducted, uh, how he conducted his investigation, and I don't know what DOJ is doing either. I wanted to go back to your question earlier. Did you ask me specifically whether investigators from the Department of Justice had questioned me or whether attorneys from the Department of Justice had questioned me? Because if it's investigators, I have to answer no. If it is, um, if it would be attorneys from the Department of Justice, I couldn't talk to you about that necessarily because if people are talked to, they're under secrecy orders. Okay. Have you appeared before a John Doe investigation in Winnebago County? Whether I have or haven't couldn't be made public. Um, and, and just so we're clear, uh, y you maintain that, that, the cr that other DAs on the staff at the time were not engaged in any criminal activity I that you know of. I, I have no credible information that leads me to believe that anybody else was engaged in criminal activity. The problem that I get into is when Brad Preby runs for judge in Outagamie County and says with regard to the Rotheau case, no, no, I tried to do the right thing. Joe wouldn't let me. But the record indicates pretty clearly mm -hmm. that Brad tried pretty hard to get that case dismissed, and it was at the, at the insistence of Joe and Mitch. Uh, and knowing the relationship that Brad had with Joe, those types of things bother me. For the mm -hmm. viewers who don't know what that case is, can you just kind of give a brief synopsis of, of what that case involves? Mr. Rotheau was arrested for OWI 4th again uh, a, a couple of years ago. And uh, the district attorney's office discovered that his original fourth offense had been dismissed and was dismissed by Brad Preby for no discernible reason. And it was later determined that uh, Mitch Shireland had been involved in the case and Brad Preby had been involved in the case and was probably, Joe had indicated to him that he wanted the case to, to be resolved because he didn't think it was a good case and Brad was doing his best to do that. Uh, I don't think that Brad knew that Joe was taking money. Brad was doing what Joe told him to do. What I don't like is him subsequently standing up and saying, oh, no, I'm totally innocent. I had no idea what was going on here. That's nonsense. <laughs> One of the arguments that, <coughs> that we've heard uh, in the community by different people is that, hey, if, if these other folks were so easy to catch, meaning other people, judges, other attorneys, what have you, if they were so easy to catch, they would have caught them by now. How do you feel about comments like that? How would you respond to something like that? Well, I don't know why it's taking so long. I, d I don't know why it took so long for the FBI to conduct their investigation. But, and, and I'm frustrated with the length of time that it's taking. But if it's a conspiracy to hide the truth, it's awfully difficult to pick out and find that one person that's going to break, that breaking point that's going to get you through the door. And you know, if the, D if the DOJ is conducting a John Doe investigation, which I think the papers have reported that it is, 
you know, it's been being conducted for a long, long time, and I'm assuming they're talking to lots and lots of people and being entirely thorough. I don't think that the Department of Justice wants to get trapped into the same thing that the FBI did, was, which was, well, you just looked at this, you didn't look at everything, you weren't thorough. And I think they want to be thorough because if they're not, there will still constantly be lingering questions about what wasn't looked at. And I don't think they want to do are there, that. Are there any indications that you're aware of that they're looking at um, things beyond simple bribery into prosecutorial misconduct, uh, suborning perjury, tampering with evidence? Um, there are at least two cases out there that one of them national television picked up on the Maloney case that uh, Joe Paul has prosecuted and, of course, the, uh, the Pease case. Uh, that Joe, uh, both very high profile headline cases. Any indication that the, the Department of Justice is looking at cases that were prosecuted by Joe that may have not have been uh, ethically sound or even criminally conducted? There's rumors in the courthouse that, that those types of investigations are going on, but I have heard no credible evidence. I, I honestly don't know. I don't know what the John Doe is looking at. I don't know who they've interviewed, and I don't know precisely the cases and the events they're looking at. If I was them, I would certainly be looking at those mm -hmm. to see if there's anything there, but I, I don't know whether or not they're doing it personally, no. Well, in a case like Pease, um, you know, which, which Stu mentioned, um, you know, h how do you even go back, say, this, say they wanted to reinvestigate this? I mean, how can you possibly do that when a lot of the evidence uh, has been destroyed basically or burned yeah i it's difficult to tell i it those cases are very it, but the fitzgibbons murder case was primarily a circumstantial case with people who were actually there uh turning on each other and testifying against each other mm -hmm. and so you know was their testimony elicited I in an inappropriate way were witnesses coached were people told to leave the state there's all of these rumors surrounding that murder and I just don't know whether or not the public, uh, I don't know whether or not a thorough investigation of that will ever be done because it seems to me that the public has this opinion. Fitzgibbons was murdered. These guys were all there. Why are we worried about who pulled the trigger and who didn't pull the trigger? They were all there. They all helped. They all did this. And I can understand the public looking at it in that kind of a fashion, but if you're in the justice system and you really do want to know who pulled the trigger, who was the aider and a better, who came up with the plan, you know, the, the there's some serious questions as to whether or not the right person was caught. Well, as a matter of fact, the, the ethics of the district attorney's office require them to, to look for the truth of the case and not necessarily the conviction of the case. And so, you know, the, the point of view you're raising is that we don't know the truth of the case yet. We may never know the truth of the case yet. That's true. And, and there are cases like that where sometimes it's almost impossible to know the truth. I think that uh, the, um, uh, the information about uh, about Mr. Price trying to take out a hit on Joe during an election year by selling marijuana and the courthouse snitch in that whole case. I think that's a far more interesting case about prosecutorial misconduct. There are some real questions there about whether or not that entire case was just fabricated to uh, kind of stop an appeals process that Price might have been going through. Because if you get him on that, who cares if he wins his appeal on the other case type of thing. And uh, for Joe to run for re-election while he's being, uh, well, people have taken out hits on him because he's such a tough DA, he really enjoyed that quite a bit and talked about it often. And, and I think that's a case that should be re-examined. So by the time you got into the DA's office in uh, 2001, um, Tom Gritton had, had been elected judge uh, and had been on the bench for probably about a year by that time. Um, whenever you talk about Joe Paulus and who knew what, Judge Gritton's name comes up, mm -hmm. and it, to some extent it was an issue in the recent election. Um, anything that you saw or have firsthand knowledge of that would, would uh, implicate Judge Gritton in any, any criminal activity in the DA's office? I, when I was an intern in the district attorney's office, Tom was still the deputy district attorney at that time. Um, and so I had the opportunity to work with him. And I saw no direct information that mm -hmm. would lead me to believe he was engaged in any criminal activity. I, I like Tom as a person. And I, I would probably put him just in the same boat as the other people. You know, why didn't you ask the question? Mm -hmm. You knew what the question was, mm -hmm. but you didn't want to ask the question. And why didn't you do that? And shame on you. Mm -hmm. But is he guilty of any sort of, of, uh, of, of intentionally engaging in criminal conduct? I don't think so. So uh, did you support Judge Gritton for re-election in, in April? I actually was uh, uh, supportive of, of, of uh, uh, Kate Seifert and the Branch 4 race and tried to be involved in that as much as I could. And, and <laughs> that's about it. Okay. 
Uh, but Carver ran against Gritton. That's true. Did you support her then or not? I Gritton? publicly supported, I didn't publicly support either candidate. Okay. I, I think that Carrie Carver is a good person. Mm -hmm. I like her. I like her dad. Um, and I think, uh, I think she was a fine candidate. Um, but the voters decided that Judge Gritton should stay another term, and I'm certainly not going to disagree with them or, or make hay about that. Well, how do you feel about, um, I, I mean, there was an awful lot made of the destruction of, of evidence, um, you know, and uh, Caroline Carver made her arguments about that. Uh, Judge Gritton countered with his own arguments, you know, typical attorney, judge kind of thing. Um, what, is, what is your feeling on that? Uh, I'll be Joe Paulus. Tom, I want you to do a records destruction policy. Here's what I wanted to say. Get it done tomorrow. Okay, Joe. Write it up. Put it in place. Done. Because Joe didn't want his name on it. But it did, Tom, did Tom engage in any sort of conspiracy with Joe yeah. to destroy records? No. He was just doing what Joe told him to do. Right. But, I mean, it does seem like the state statutes do um, have some outlines of, of what can and can't be destroyed. And if you look at, at the statutes, anyway, it does look like, you know, Gritton probably operated within the statutes. But, you know, there's always new things being added, and, and I haven't gone that far yet. But it, it just seems like when you have a murder case, like the Fitzgibbons case, um, you know, that's pretty high profile. To destroy something from a case like that seems a little foolish no matter how old the case may be. I would like to see what the records destruction policy said uh, before I make any I I comments about that. I, the problem is Crawford, the Crawford file was destroyed. The Crawford file was, a, was an investigative file that was never charged. So does the record destruction policy as per statute apply to investigative files of the DA's office that never result in charges or only to cases that are charged? And then once they're charged, they must retain the record. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that everybody points to Crawford as being the guy that kind of got off scot-free in this whole thing and may have been primary, at least that's the rumor that's out there, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, his file is gone. Mm -hmm. I, I have a problem with that, even though it may not have been a violation of policy because it wasn't a charged case. But when, I, I don't know the answers to all of that. When Tom Gritton was uh, visiting the editorial board of the Northwestern prior <coughs> to the election, we asked him um, how long is the stigma going to be over the courthouse as it relates to Joe Paulus and people's uh, linkage to Joe Paulus. He said, if I win this election, it's over and done with. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? No, no. The, the, the stigma will be over the courthouse until some authoritative agency throws open the doors and says, we conducted a thorough investigation. Here's what we found. Here's the charges we're doing. We've talked to everybody. This is it. And if the AG's office is transparent about what they've done in the investigation they've conducted, I think then it's time to say this is done. There's always going to be rumors. There's always going to be conspiracy theories. That will never go away. But I think that if this investigation is transparent, that should put an end to it. But the fact that people didn't believe that Judge Gritton was involved in criminal activity, believed that he'd been doing a good job on the bench and voted him back into office, has little or nothing to do with whether or not Joe Paulus engaged in a wider array of criminal activity when he was the DA. They're separate issues. Well, and speaking of Paulus now, and, and rumor, innuendo, conjecture, and, and conspiracy theories, um, there, there was just that um, a few weeks back when uh, Mr. Paulus was listed as being in transit. And the rumor was that he was back in Wisconsin testifying before a secret panel. Um, do you know anything about that? And if so, can you share it with us? Uh, the only thing that I've heard, and actually I've heard this from news sources, is that he was in either Milwaukee or Madison testifying and may very well have been there for up to one to two weeks testifying. And it was only towards the end of the testimony that uh, it leaked out that he was actually in transit. And I don't know whether or not that's true. That's the rumor that I've heard. But it would, f it, I like it because it fits my theory that he's holding back certain amounts of information in order to work out a decent deal with the state so that he doesn't do a prison term in Wisconsin and therefore is, is releasing a lot of the information that he has to the Attorney General's office. That may or may not be true, uh, but I, you know, I know that if the Attorney General's office has enough to charge him with conspiracy and corruption and some other charges that, and, and he's facing prison, he is not going to want to do a day, and, sh and frankly shouldn't do a day in the Wisconsin state prison system. He'll be dead within a week. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if they cut a deal with him to say, you be honest with us, you tell us the whole story, put it all out on the table, and we will, we will make a deal with you, it's fine with me. The, uh, the fact that 
the Attorney General has got stiff competition f for the nomination of her own party, uh, Kathleen Falk running against her in the primary. Um, are you inclined to believe that there's politics involved with the timing of the investigation and any subsequent charges that may be, uh, be filed? That rumor is out there. I, at this point, am not willing to accuse the Attorney General's office of taking a case of this seriousness and magnitude and fooling around with it for their own political purposes. Okay. We'll see what happens and what they charge and how transparent they are. As the um, <coughs> uh, allegations and charges for uh, uh, Joe Paulus played out in federal court, it became pretty evident that there was one critical case that you came across and was investigated by Detective Gallner of the uh, Town of Menasha Police Department. And that was a Connie Christensen case. Can, can you shed some light on how out of all of the hundreds of cases, OWI cases the DA's office deals with, how that one came to light, how that caught your attention, and how that, how that unfolded from the time that it became apparent there was something wrong with that particular case? Uh, we had decided that, that uh, something was wrong with Joe's office, something was certainly wrong with Joe, and, that, and Tom and I had decided that let's try to figure out what this is and how are we going to do this. This guy has to go. Well, let's run against him. Not only could we maybe make the case that he shouldn't be DA anymore, but um, people might start talking to us. We might, people might feel comfortable enough to talk with us and think that we're not one of his guys. And a couple of weeks after I started quietly talking to people about running against him, I got a phone call from a person whom I, I don't particularly want to name who said, listen, a friend of a friend of mine is named Connie Christensen. We were out having lunch, um, and she told me the story. I think you should talk to her. So I went to, uh, I looked the case up and, and then the DA's system and tried to find the file. Well, there was no file in the DA's office. So I went to the clerk's office. I got the file. I went to the courtroom. I got the transcript. I put that together, looked at it, and thought, this is it. This is why all of this is going on. This looks like a dismissal of a case for no good reason. So I called Ann up, and I said, Ann, would you go talk to this woman? Could, could you explain the relationship between Ann Gallner and yourself at that time? Oh, sure. Ann had recently left the district attorney's office under force from Joe. She was the domestic abuse investigator. I was the domestic right. abuse prosecutor, and we worked closely together. Um, I trusted Ann very much, and I didn't know who else to go to. And, and having worked with her, I knew that she was very, very good at interviewing people and talking with people. And so I said, would you go talk to her? And she was a little concerned about it because it was out of her jurisdiction. But I said, you're not investigating uh, on your own time. You're investigating at my request. And I know it's out of your jurisdiction, but I don't trust anybody else. Go down there and see if she'll sign a statement. It's not an official thing. So she went down there. And sure enough, Connie was willing to talk to her. And so then we had the statement, the police report, the, D the clerk's file, and the transcript. And we knew exactly what this was. And that was the case that then gave us the template. And I went to Judge Key and said, Judge, look what I got. And then other people started calling, and other people started saying, why don't you look at this case and that case and the other case? And we would get the police reports and the transcript and the clerk's office file, and we had 17 or 18 in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Ann and I really got into a little bit of a battle about what we should do. I said we should find more. Ann said, no, we've got a duty to report, and we need to go. And she finally said, that's it, I'm going. And she went to the FBI, and then the next day we went to the FBI. She gave the cases that she had. We gave the cases that we had. Meanwhile, um, uh, Judge Hazi and Judge Key were saying, well, with what you've given us, we have an obligation to report to OLR now, so we'll do that end of it. And they did a subsequent. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so in, in, uh, in reality, that, you know, uh, E.J. Jelinski, the whistleblower, and the courage that it took to, to take on the system, there's a whistleblower in the background that wishes to remain anonymous or you're just not comfortable I revealing their identity without their permission? I've never asked him, her, it whether or not they wanted me to release him, her, its name, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that him, her, it would rather be <laughs> left alone. Not <coughs> because they necessarily have done anything wrong, but just because of, of the fact that there's all this publicity and they would yeah they would okay. prefer not to. EJ, what was the worst moment of that that time span between the time that that you uh, announced you're going to run for district attorney and the time that charges were actually filed, which was a good two years after the after the fact. The period of time from May 14th through um, March of the following year, May 14th of 2002 through the March of the following year. On May 14th, my wife's birthday, <laughs> I was fired and escorted out of the district attorney's office um, uh, by sheriff's deputies. 
and uh, then lost the primary terribly. Had a long battle about whether or not to release those infamous <coughs> tapes with a couple of people, and um, did so. Lost the primary, and uh, then didn't know what to do with myself until I started my own practice. And in that period of time, where nobody believes what you say, uh, most people are upset with what you did, and um, um, there's no end in sight. That was a very, very difficult time. Um, and God bless my wife, she stayed with me as my girlfriend through all of that, and so if we made it through that, we were fine. I remember marching in the Memorial Day Parade in Menasha, and a woman spit on me and said, you're a, you're a tattletale, Mr. Jelinski, you're a tattletale. Mm -hmm. That was not fun. Do you, do you regret the, um, the existence of the tapes and the release of the tapes? <clears throat> Personally, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was very difficult. Uh, to do that. There was an internal battle within uh, my campaign committee about whether or not to do it. And I actually was f saying, I don't think we should. Uh, but I eventually saw a reason. And, and the reason was this. The, the arguments that were given to me and that ultimately I came to believe in and still do is that Le Bill Lennon's in this race. We know Joe's going to get 30 some percent because he's the incumbent. What happens if you and Bill split up the anti-Joe vote and, b and, and Joe wins the primary? What happens if he gets reelected for two solid, or for however long it takes, he can obstruct. He's got access to the files. He can do whatever he wants to do. He's got to get out, and he's got to get out now. we got to get rid of him. What do we do? And it was murder-suicide. We knew the second that that section of the tape that talked about uh, the sexual activity in his office was out, we knew that that was it, that I was dead. We knew that that was going to happen. And, but we did it anyway, and it was, it was very difficult it was a very difficult decision to make. The original taping was, and most of the tape that was actually released, was, was Joe talking about his opinion about our work performance. And it was done for that reason. We thought that he would fire us and that we would have nothing in our file. So we would be fired for incompetence, but it, he would be saying we were fired for incompetence and we had nothing to refute that, <coughs> to rebut that. But it, during that same course of a conversation, uh, he also went into what everybody in the office knew he referred to as his dark period. And we continued to tape, and um, it, we're never intending to release that. But once Bill Lennon jumped in, it was th the thought of him winning and continuing to be district attorney was we just it was it was unthinkable. And, and, and I know that you took a lot of heat for releasing those tapes. Well, I said I wasn't done. Well, <laughs> I, I, I know, <laughs> I know, I know I did. <laughs> but uh, you you did take an awful lot of heat for releasing them. But but you know, I I spoke with uh, the wife of a judge from Outagamie County who said, you know what, if if we had not heard even the small portion that we did, we never would have believed anything about Joe that was less than grand. Mm -hmm. You know, people just did not believe that he was capable of doing even the lewd types of things that he was talking about on the tape, much less all this other stuff. And, and now, anything's possible. Yeah, and, and, and who knows what the full breadth of the investigation will be. It, it, it's very possible that the AG's office could say, we've conducted an entire investigation and this is all rumor and innuendo and we're done now. We're going home. There's nothing else here. But I doubt that. I doubt that. Well, and, and with Peg Lautenschlager <coughs> uh, as our Attorney General, you know, she has her own um, past problems with Mr. Paulus. If her office does bring forth some charges, I think all of us at this table know that the argument will be made by somebody out there saying, this is all political, even if it's not a campaign season. This is all political. That's true. Uh, but Joe supported President Bush, Peg Lautenschlager hired <laughs> Joe, uh, Judge Key worked with Joe, uh, all of the people uh, in the district attorney's office who are now up and out of Gamey County and in Winnebago worked with Joe. It, where are you going to go to find somebody that didn't know him or didn't have dealings with him? Yeah. Everybody, you know, you can make the dirty hands argument for everybody. I have thrown mm -hmm. the dirty hands argument around myself in fits of rage and regret doing so on a number of occasions. But... Well, she, uh, the last time uh, Peg talked with the editorial board of the Northwestern, um, she was expecting the question, uh, being in, in Joe's hometown, obviously, and uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't couch it as a prepared statement or a rehearsed statement, but she was very quick to say, based on my track record, my history, I have completely recused myself, I have asked my investigators and the lawyers in my office not to discuss the case in front of me, not to bring me up to date. I have to be 
as far away from this as possible within the confines of the office. Um, I found that a little bit hard to believe. Uh, what, what would you say if, if the Attorney General made that statement to you? That's the appropriate thing to do. Uh, it's the public thing to say and it's appropriate and her very able investigator should handle it and be out in front. Mm -hmm. But if she doesn't know what's going on, I'll eat my hat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, a couple of weeks ago, as the uh, uh, investigation was being shut down in the Winnebago County uh, District Attorney's Office, uh, there was a letter leaked out of the office that was heavily redacted. Um, it appeared to have come from the Attorney General's office. It appeared to have a, a, a fair amount of disdain for the activities of the District Attorney's investigation. Um, have, have you seen the letter? And, and if you have, what do you make of the tone and the context of the letter? I've seen the letter, and it seems to me that the writer of the letter is saying, gee whiz, if you guys are going to do something and give us something, why don't you give us something that has some substance to it instead of a bunch of rumors? You know, put up or shut up, mm -hmm. I think is what the letter says. That's my opinion of it. <laughs> so if, if that letter, which has is, is made the rounds now, and, and I think people, reasonable people can draw that inference from the letter, does that raise the question of the, of the extent of the district attorney's investigation? Were they trading in rumors and innuendo and lacking substance to, uh, to act on? Well, uh, to listen to Bill, you would think it took three and a half years for him to realize that that's what they were doing. I don't, I don't honestly think so. I think that the district attorney's office uh, has been conducting an investigation. I think they found some information that's most likely going to be helpful to the attorney general's office. Um, but the, the way that the investigation is conducted, Bill Lennon's ability to manage the office and to, to handle uh, any of those types of issues, I think is, is less than desirable. And I, I think the Attorney General's office is saying, in essence, you know, let us handle it, boys. Let the professionals take care of this. And I think that's maybe a little harsh, but how do we know mm -hmm. the quality of the investigation unless they're willing to release the information? Mm -hmm. we, we won't know. You um, have, have mentioned a few times the way Mr. Lennon is, is running the current district attorney's office. And um, I, I think probably one of the most prominent cases there where there were some major screw-ups were the uh, Nina police detective Dan Ringoli. Um, you know, uh, what was it, seven charges filed against him, uh, most of them felonies. Uh, I think six were felonies. One, I believe, was a misdemeanor. Um, it, it took a year or better to investigate this and to bring charges, and then every one of those charges was thrown out by uh, Judge Bruce Schmidt, um, saying that it was convoluted, that, that the criminal complaint was uh, convoluted, it was confusing, it contained errors, uh, omissions, and misrepresentations, not errors. Um, you know, and yet he felt that that was his shining moment, basically. Um, you, of course, had some things to say about that. <laughs> so why don't you tell us what you, what you had to say about that case? I sat through that whole hearing, and personally, um, <laughs> I was, listen, uh, 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 Bill is a, a nice man, and he's been a lawyer for a long time. But I think most people in the community are aware right now that when Bill gets up in front of people, he gets a little nervous. Mm -hmm. And when he gets nervous and he's under pressure, he doesn't do well. He says things without thinking about it, and he kind of blurts a little bit. And uh, the Dringoli hearing was pretty close to that. To accuse uh, Dan Dringoli and being complicit in the murder of Adam Schultz when there's no basis for it in the complaint or in the testimony uh, was everybody in the courtroom just went, wow. I can't believe you asked that question. <laughs> and it's, it's, but it's those types of things. But then when he comes out to the press and he says, well, if I was the judge, I would have done the same thing, and Dringoli was my finest hour, he doesn't mean that. He's just nervous, and he's, he's just saying things. Okay, but, but I think it does come to a, 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 I mean, there's a question of competence there, at least in my mind there is, a year or better of investigating something before you bring charges and then you can't draft a criminal complaint any better than that? I don't think he drafted that complaint. <laughs> well, who did? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, who, I, who, I, who would I, you suspect? I don't know. I, I, it's just, he didn't seem to be familiar with it. He didn't seem to understand it. He didn't seem to be able to defend it. Um, I, you know, I, I hope that he's drafted the new one. We'll see what happens with that. I make no, I, I I'm not familiar enough with the case to know whether or not uh, there's any substance to the allegations 
uh, that Dan Dringoli committed crimes. Mm -hmm. But what I do know is that the district attorney has managed to irritate both those people who believe he's innocent and those people who believe he's guilty, and that's a u singularly unique skill that Bill Lennon seems to have. What? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what, what other cases or, or situations within the office um, do you, E.J. Jelinski, have a problem with the way Mr. Lennon is handling it? I, from an administrative point of view, I, I, I look at a district attorney's office that uh, is handling things in a fashion that I, I personally find irritating. Uh, if you're a district attorney, you take the cases that come before you, you analyze them, you charge them, you take them to trial. What's going on in the district attorney's office right now is a lot of charging the case, not reaching an agreement or a resolution, uh, going right up to the day of trial, realizing you're not ready to try the case, dismissing the case, then reissuing in a different court, starting over again, um, not interviewing witnesses until the day of trial, subpoenaing officers, and not bothering to contact the defense bar to see whether or not you even need them for the hearing so that you don't have to have them come and be paid time and a half. Um, adequately charging out your complaints, um, piling on charges, a lot of games and tactics that are generally used by people who, there's two kinds of prosecutors. There's a prosecutor that can charge the case, can go forward and go to trial, and they either go to trial because they got a good case or they deal it out because they've got an okay case but they know they've got proof problems. And then there's the prosecutor that charges the case out and puts on a face of I'm going to be law and order all the way through and get your client and take care of you know, the society and safety in the community. But they really don't know what they're doing. And so they just play a lot of parlor games <coughs> and waste time and money in the system. And I see a lot of that. And it's the district attorney's office, it's the district attorney's job to identify those problems that exist, to try to, to, to put them to rest, to make sure that things are running in a smooth fashion, that he's not wasting money and time. And I, he, he has billed himself as a district attorney who is not necessarily a trial attorney, but who is a good administrator in the office. And I don't think he's proven that either. Uh, given the, uh, <coughs> the fact that he uh, made an unsuccessful run for judge and uh, you backed his opponent, was your support based on your belief in Karen Seifert's qualification or was it based on your lack of confidence in, in Bill Lennon being a judge? When uh, Bill... P people have mentioned that because Bill jumped into the DA's race and, and, uh, DA's race and got in between Joe and I and won the DA's spot. And it, do I harbor ill feelings about that? I look at what Bill Lennon did in that race and I think, you know, looking back, that was the most politically astute thing I've ever seen somebody do. He came in there and that was the, his time, his moment, and it was perfect. He let Joe and I fight it out. And I don't really hold any grudges with regard to that. If he had come into the office in that way, and had restored integrity, conducted an investigation, got that office running smooth and tightly and on an, in, a, in, a, in a great way, and had done a good job, I wouldn't be here. But he came in and he's kind of kind of just screwed around with the office and not really done what I think he came in to do or what a decent district attorney does do. And I look at Karen Seifert and I say, I think she's a very good attorney. I think she knows what she's doing. And I, in fact, called Bill Lennon up and said, look, I'm going to support Karen Seifert because I think she's the best candidate. And he said, okay, I understand. Well, now, when you say that uh, observing the way Bill Lennon runs the office, um, if, if he had done all of the things that he said he was going to do, you wouldn't be here. I is that an indication that you're contemplating a run for district oh, attorney? Oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. I am not foreclosing the notion that I may run again. Um, I, I would like to get out of the Northwestern area of circulation before I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's shrinking. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, I, uh, I might run for something again in the future. But looking back on everything that's happened, I'm now in private practice. Uh, I work six blocks from my home. I make my own hours, and I am my own boss. And I think I've clearly shown people that I don't work well with others. And I, I'm really enjoying uh, private practice right now, and I don't know that I'd want to give that up. Uh, there may be a, a primary election uh, for DA's office with uh, uh, Christian Gossett. I've not met Christian, but he's made an announcement he's running for the office, which would constitute a primary in, in September. Um, would you support the incumbent, or would you support the challenger in a, in a primary? Uh, in a primary, I would support the challenger. I think that uh, I, I, I really have, I, well, I've made it clear, I have issues with the way that, that Bill Lennon is running things. Um, I've had dealings with Christian Gossett in a professional capacity, and I've found him to be an able attorney, and, and I think he might do a very good job. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know. Here's Bill's problem. He's got 140 days to convince 8,000 people to change their minds. And well, that was going to be my question. Yeah, do. I mean, he, he really lost his shirt um, running for judge. I got more primary votes. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and and now, he come later this fall, he's going to seek uh, re-election to his current job. Do you think that he can overcome that hurdle? And I think you just said no. It, it's going to be a very, very tough. It'll be hurdle awfully, to clear. It'll be awfully difficult. Um, I suppose if Charles Manson decides to run, Bill would have a shot. <laughs> um, he is. He's going to have, a, if a candidate runs against Bill, who is a reasonable attorney with a decent background um, and who is professional, he's going to have a, Bill's going to have a very difficult time because this, this election in the fall is primarily, in my opinion, going to be a referendum on Bill. It's not going to be so much about the opposing candidate. It's going to be on whether or not we as a community want to have Bill on as the district attorney. And I think there's about 8,000 people out there that voted against him who will most likely vote in the fall primary. It's going to be awfully difficult for him to change their minds, especially when he says things um, that are, are kind of tone deaf. You know, he criticized Karen Seifert quite a bit for having a lack of experience, but never answered the question that popped into most people's minds, which is, well, if you've got so much experience, how did you screw up during goalie? And, and there have been others, too. The, uh, the cab key case where the woman was driving and blew through a stop sign. Yes. Um, and, and, and her son but, died. But he refuses to answer these questions. He, he continues to want to be, you know, he, he mm -hmm. keeps to his campaign line, but he doesn't answer the obvious questions that people are asking, which is, what's wrong? What's happening here? And he needs to explain himself or he's going to be in trouble. Is there anything that you think he can do between now and when uh, the primary starts? <laughs> Whenever I make political predictions, I get into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Um, so I won't make any, but I think, I think he's got a real uphill battle. I really do. I really do. Okay. So when, when the movie is made, who plays E.J. Jelinski <laughs> in, in the starring role? <laughs> is Chris Farley still alive? <laughs> 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 I don't. I have no idea. I have no idea. At, at, <laughs> at, at some point, would, seriously, at some point, would you consider writing a book or an extended article for law review or something that would lay out... Uh, the experiences of a young district attorney in a corrupt uh, office and I, I would love to do that there's one thing that's getting in the way of that and that's that I'm I'll be honest I'm lazy I just couldn't get to that if somebody if somebody wanted to, to write a book or, or to talk about it I'd be happy to be involved in that but to do it myself I, I no no I it, I've said this before I think you know I keep checking my voicemail for dateline but nobody ever calls <laughs> But, I mean, for, for young attorneys in law school, is there not a great lesson here to, to share with them about stepping into the, the, the threshold of power and speaking truth to power? And, and doesn't E.J. Jelinski have something to convey to young idealistic attorneys coming out of law school? I think it's a very interesting ethics question. Um, if you bring in the political aspect of it and the taping and uh, the investigation and if you, if you bring that all together, and you, it's a very, very complex set of ethical issues for a young attorney to take a look at, some bad and some good, and I think it would be, I think it would be an interesting exam question in law school. What do you do? Okay. E.J., thanks so much. You're always a fun guest. Oh, thank you for having <laughs> me. Thank you. And Stu, thank you. I this, enjoyed this it. This was a real pleasure. And see, you thank made you. it through just fine. <laughs> you made it through just fine. And uh, oh, as always, thanks to all of you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.